You're watching a Channel 98 NBISD TV production. Hey, welcome to another episode of That Geometry Show. I'm your Funkadelic host, Kevin Corby, as always. And if it's your first time tuning into the show or you're a seasoned watcher, I thank both y'all out there. Now, today's episode is going to be very, very similar to some stuff we've done in the previous episodes. Similar, that is, and not congruent, okay? There's going to be a lot of overlapping topics from previous episodes, but today we're going to look specifically at the similarity of triangles. All about triangles, again, it's a very hard shape to get away from when we're talking about geometry. So you know the routine. Get those worksheets off the website, get them out in front of you, have a sharp pencil ready to go, and do some math with me right there in the privacy of your own home. All right, lesson 19, that's what we're in store for today. It's going to really correspond uh, pretty nicely with your Glencoe Geometry Chapter 7.3. I am going to talk something a little bit about 7.4. I'll let you know when I get to that point. But it's all about similar triangles. Now, in previous episodes, we've already talked about similarity, and we've talked about proving congruent triangles. Uh, there were several different combinations of triangles that we could use to prove that two triangles were congruent. We didn't have to show that all three angles on all three sides were congruent. But one of the cases that did not work was the angle-angle-angle case, okay, the AAA combination. If we look at these two triangles right here, we have triangle ABC and triangle DEF. Now, here's why the angle-angle-angle property was not sufficient to show two triangles were congruent. If I can show that this angle A is congruent to angle D, and I can show that by putting a single arc here, and we can see that angle B with the two marks is congruent to angle E, and angle C with three marks is congruent to angle F. So all of these corresponding angles are congruent, but it's pretty obvious from you watching on the TV screen that these triangles can't be congruent because one of them is obviously larger than the other. Okay? The other thing that tells us one is larger than the other is the side lengths are actually given. This side is 10. This side is 20, or 2 times 10. This side here is 6. This side is twice as large again, 12. This side is 7, and this side is twice as large again, 14. So these triangles, although they have three corresponding congruent angles, are not congruent triangles. But because the angles are congruent, and the sides are the same uh, dilation factor, or, or the same scale factor, remember from last week, uh, larger than the other, we can say that they are similar. So we could say that triangle ABC is similar. Remember this little tilde right here is our symbol for similarity. It's similar to triangle DEF. And just to point out again that the ordering of the letters does matter. ABC means angle A corresponds to DEF, D, and angle B corresponds to E, and angle C corresponds to F. So the order does matter. You need to be very careful when you're writing down the order. Now, what do we know about similarity? If two shapes are similar, then one is said to be an enlargement or a dilation of the other. And we've talked about dilations on a previous episode when we talked about transformations. Basically, the shapes will have the same shape. They both look like triangles, and the angles are the same, but they definitely uh, are not the same size. So same shape, different size, similarity. Now, a dilation from our transformation episode, we learned, was not an isometry. Now, just to review what isometry is, an isometry was a rigid transformation. Those were like your shifts, your reflections, or your rotations. They preserve the size and the shape. They just put it in a different orientation. A dilation actually changes the side. Okay? So this means that two shapes will have the same angles, and their size will be in the same proportion. Or another word to say proportion from last time is they'll have the same ratio of measurements to the corresponding sides. Okay? Now let's look at these specific triangles. Just to review again, what do we know about similar triangles uh, based upon what we learned about similar polygons? Well, in this triangle again, we have triangle ABC is similar to triangle DEF. Okay? So ABC, DEF, they're exactly the same. We know that angle A is congruent to angle D. Angle B, the corresponding angle, is congruent to angle E. And angle C, right here, is congruent to angle F. And again, we notate that by putting uh, the corresponding hash marks on here. A 1, 
two hashes and three hashes for the corresponding angles. Now, here's the nice thing about similarity and proportionality. The corresponding side lengths, although they are not the exact same length, are proportionate. They have the exact same ratio. So we could say that side AB is proportionate to side DE. AB is to DE as side BC is to EF, as side CA is to side FD. Those ratios, regardless of which of the three sides you take, as long as it's the corresponding side you're relating it to, they will give you the same magical number, and that will be the scale factor, okay? And it's unique for each of the triangles that are similar. Now let's see if we can figure out what it actually is for these two triangles. I'm going to go ahead and write the ratios right here. The length of segment AB is given to be 10, is to segment DE, which is 20, should be the same as BC, which I have written here as 6, is to EF, which is 12, as CA, CA is 7, is to FD, which is 14. Now, staring at those ratios right there in unsimplified format, it's hard to tell that they are equivalent, okay? And that's where simplifying comes in handy. If we simplify 10 20ths, we get 1 half, because 20 is exactly twice the size of 10, or 10 is exactly half the size of 20. 6 twelfths, it's the same thing. 6 twelfths simplifies to 1 half, and 7 fourteenths simplifies also to 1 half. So, the ratios of the corresponding sides, any three of the corresponding side lengths, has the exact same number. So in this case, the number 1 half is called the ratio of similitude. Now, if you don't want to call it the ratio of similitude, or your teacher doesn't call it the ratio of similitude, remember that's just a fancy thing for what we talked about last week. It's the scale factor. Okay? Now, notice what we're doing here. We're taking the, the ratio of the small triangle to the large triangle. And that's why we're getting one half, because the smaller one is one, the larger one's two. If we were taking a similar ratio of the large to the small, then all these ratios would be flipped. And instead of one half, we would get a two. Okay? Now, let's, let's analyze what that actually means in terms of the triangles. If I'm relating small to large and I get one to two, again, that means the small triangle is half the size of the larger. If I flip the ratio and did large to small, I would get two over one or just two. And that means that the uh, larger triangle is twice the size of the smaller. So the smaller triangle is half the size of the larger, or the larger is twice the size of the smaller. So whenever you're working problems, it's very, very important that you read carefully which one are you comparing to the other, the smaller to the large or the larger to the small. You can imagine that this little ratio bar, the division bar, is representing the actual word to. So this would be small to large, okay? Now, let's look at some problems that involve similar triangles. There are many different types of these types of problems, and so naturally there's going to be many different strategies to deal with them. Now, you want to just have one way picked out, and if you get the right answer, and you got it a little bit differently than your friend got it, not a big deal, because there may be many, many different ways to arrive at the correct answer. Okay, and I'll show you what I mean here. Now, the easiest types of these types of problems are the ones that deal with similar triangles in two separate diagrams. Okay, actually two separate diagrams drawn. Now let's read carefully. For similar triangles, very important that we identify they are similar, uh, triangles RAD, so RAD, and LUV, love. The instructions say to solve for X, so there's X right there. Now notice the lettering right here is important. RAD is similar to LUV, so angle R is congruent to angle L. Angle R is congruent to angle L. Angle A is congruent to angle U, so I'll put double tick marks there. And angle D is congruent to angle V, so triples there, triples there. Now, notice that these diagrams are actually drawn in proportion to each other. They're actually facing the same way. You're not necessarily going to be given diagrams in, where they're drawn like that. This triangle or this triangle could be drawn rotated, however you want. It would be more helpful in that case to then redraw them so that they were oriented in the same fashion. It just makes things easier when you're looking to set up your ratios. Now, there's a lot of ways you could set up the ratios. Uh, whichever your teacher prefers, or if she lets you pick any way, whichever you think is easier. 
The first way I'm going to do it is I'm going to be looking at ratios of small to large. And I'm going to look at corresponding parts. So here's what we want to do. I need to solve for x, so I need to get this side involved. So I'm going to need to get its corresponding side involved. And I can only have one known in an equation, so I'm going to have to get the other two side lengths involved. So I'm going to have to get 6 and 12. So I wasn't given information about the other two sides, and it turns out I'm not going to need it. So here we go, small to large. I'll say that 10, the side length RA, is to the uh, other corresponding side on the large triangle, x. So this is side on the small to the side on the large, is to another side on the small, 6, to its corresponding side, uv, on the large. And we've set up a proportion. So all we have to do to solve the proportion now is cross multiply. But remember, it might be easier before you cross multiply to look to simplify the numeric ratios. 10 over x is OK. But 6 12, 6 goes into itself once, goes into 12 twice. That's going to make your numbers a little bit smaller when you cross multiply. Now I'll cross multiply to get my cross products. 10 times 2 is 20, equals x times 1 is x. Well, solving for x is real easy. There it is, x equals 20. If you want to flip it around so your variable's on the left, that would be OK. All right, now, there's another way to set up your ratio. If you don't want to go small to large, you can stay on the small triangles first. You can go small part to small part corresponds to the large part over the large part. Okay, So let's see how that would work. I would take the two sides on the small. 10 is to 6. We'd write that as 10 is to 6 as 10, 6. So it's going to be x is to 12. Now notice that it does set up a little bit differently than this other ratio. But you'll see that we're going to get the same answer. Now before I cross multiply, notice 10, 6 can be simplified. It goes to 5 thirds equals x over 12. Now I can cross multiply. 5 times 12 is 60. And I get 3 times x is 3x. Now solving for x by dividing both sides by 3, I get x equals 20. Okay, So right there, there's two different ways to do the exact same problem. And notice we got the same answer. So however you're more comfortable setting up the ratios. The key is, so long as you're not breaking any mathematical rules, whether it's algebraic or setting up the ratios, you're going to probably get the right answer. Some ways are just more efficient than others. OK. Now, many problems involve similar triangles that have one triangle that sits on top of another triangle. It's not drawn as two separate diagrams. And there's a different strategy for that. So let's look at this example here. We have triangle ABC. And inside of there, we have a little triangle DBE. Now, <laughs> assuming that these are similar, can we do that? Well, not really. We want to be careful when we assume. Let's see what we have here. Notice these arrows right here. That means that segment DE and AC are parallel to each other. So we can fall back on our knowledge of parallel lines. It might help to extend these lines out. Okay. Now I have two parallel lines. I can think of this right here as the transversal. Okay. Now let's look at this angle here, angle BDE and angle DAC. These are corresponding angles in our uh, parallel lines and transversals here. And remember what we said about corresponding angles. Corresponding angles are congruent. So this angle is congruent to this angle. Well, uh, we can look at the exact same thing over here. Uh, extending these lines out, this could be a new transversal. This angle would correspond to this angle. So we have two angles that are congruent. Now, let's look at this. Angle B right here is a shared angle. And that's what's unique about these problems, where it's two triangles drawn inside one shape. There's a shared angle. So they both share angle B. So of course, angle B is going to be congruent to itself. So since I have all three angles corresponding congruent with each other, we can say that this triangle is similar. Now we can get on to finally uh, answering the question, now that we've established similarity. We want to find the length of BE. Well, that's this length here. You can keep calling it segment BE, but in mathematics, if we don't know something, it, it's uh, tempting to call it X. So that's what I'm going to do. Now, what we have to do here is try and solve X by using the information given. Now, there's two ways to attack this problem. Here's the first method. You have to use the full sides of the two triangles when dealing with the problem. We can't use DA and we can't use EC since those are part of this trapezoid and not the entire triangle. So let's go ahead and set it up. It doesn't really matter how you do it. We'll set it up 
in this case doing a small to large. We really don't have time to set it up both ways every time. So I'm going to look at BD right here. That's the side on my small triangle. And the corresponding side on the large triangle is BA, which is going to have length not just 4 and not just 8, but their sum, 4 plus 8, which is 12. Now I've got to look at the X, which is I need to get involved. So that's X on the short triangle. And the corresponding side on the large triangle is the entire length, X plus 9. X plus 9. Okay. Once you've established your proportion, you set it up very, very carefully, pretty much you're home free. It's just a routine algebra problem. So let's go ahead and simplify 4 twelfths. 4 goes in itself once, 12 goes three times. And I do that before I cross multiply. It makes things a little bit easier. Now when I cross multiply, 1 times x plus 9 is x plus 9. And cross multiplying here, I get 3x. So now I'll subtract x from both sides, and I get 9 equals 3x minus 1x, which is 2x. And dividing both sides by 2, I get x equals 9 halves, which I like. It's a nice number. Uh, that's also equivalent to 4.5. Okay? Okay, it's time to take a little bitty break here. So uh, watch these public service announcements, freshen up a bit, and resharpen those pencils and come right back with us. A wonderful resource for the district um, for the students to come to and the parents to come to because I can answer those questions on where to start and and you know what's the first step you need to take in order to make college a reality there's a lot of resources in here there's a lot of printed material and of course we have 16 computers and I recommend don't ever pay anybody to pay for a scholarship search because those are things that we can do for free and I can show you how had a senior um, who was not sure that she was ever going to make it to college and she got into UTSA. I'm so proud of her. She's, she's very successful. I just heard from her recently. She got a very large chunk of financial aid through her research efforts. Come visit us. We're here. We want the word to get out to the community that uh, this is a resource that NBISD provides for our students and um, take advantage of it. It's free. Okay, welcome back. You know, the next example, while you were at break, he was talking to me. He said he's very excited, very anxious for you to see him. So let's go meet that next example. All right, another way to do this problem is to realize the special property. And this is getting into section 7.4. But it fits in nicely into this lesson here. Remember we said that these two lines were parallel. Here's the, here's the theorem. If a line is parallel to one side of a triangle, in this case, segment DE is parallel to AC, and we can tell from the arrows, it divides the, the two sides proportionately. So we can say that AD is proportional to DB. This side here is proportional to this side. As CE, this side here, is proportional to EB. Now that's only if these two sides are parallel in a triangle. Okay? It doesn't really work for all polygons, and it doesn't work for just any old line that darts across here. It has to be parallel. Why would we want to use this instead of the other one when the other one works so nicely? Well, just because we can, and as it turns out, the math is a little bit easier because now we can set up the proportion. We could say AD, which is 8, is to DB, which is 4, is proportional to uh, CE, which is 9, is to BE, which remember we were calling X. And now, really, the problem is a little bit easier. If I simplify 8 fourths is 2, I get 2 equals 9 over X. And if you want to call that 2 over 1 so you can have a proportion, that's fine. So now I'll cross multiply and I get 2x equals 9, which when I divide by 2, I get x equals the same number, 9 halves or 4.5. So just be careful if you're using that. You have to have parallel lines and it has to be in a triangle. Okay? Let's look at another similar example that's asking us to find something a little bit different here. Looks like the same shape. We have a triangle inside of another triangle. We've already established that they are similar. Uh, because of the consecutive angles and the shared angle. Now we're trying to find segment EC. Well, that's this right here, so let's call it X. It's a different part of the triangle we're trying to find. Now again, 
We could set this up several different ways, but we have to use the full lengths of the triangle. We did small to large last time, so I think I'm going to go small, small, proportional to large, large. So let's look at this piece here. This is the small piece 4 is to this small piece 8 as the corresponding large piece 4 plus 6, 10, is to the corresponding large piece 8 plus x. Okay, so we set that up as small, small is to corresponding large, large. Now look to simplify before you cross multiply. It makes life a little easier. 4 eighths is the same as 1 half. And the 10 eighths we can't simplify because uh, there's not a common factor with the 8 and the x and the 10. So that's just 10 over 8 plus x. Now we can cross multiply. 1 times 8 plus x is 8 plus x. And 10 times 2 is 20. So now to solve for x, we just subtract 8 from both sides. And we get 20 minus 8 which is 12. Okay, Pretty easy. Kind of a similar example, but a little bit different. Finding a different part. Here's yet another way to do it. And this one you have to be real careful about. Okay, Find segment DE. Again, we have our familiar triangle within a triangle. But I want to identify carefully what I'm trying to find. I'm trying to find DE right here, which is X. Now, in the last example, we could have used the parallel proportion rule because we are trying to find one of the lengths of the sides that this parallel line divides it proportionally into. We can't really do that here because this parallel line pro uh, divides these proportionally, not this or this. We know nothing about the proportionality of this side to this side, just this being parallel. So in this case, we are going to have to use the full side lengths. Okay? Let's go ahead and set it up small to large. I think that's uh, at least what I'm more comfortable using. So I'm going to head and pick uh, the small side right here. BD is 5 is to the corresponding large part, which is 5 plus 10, or 15. As, now I'm going to have to get the x involved. So that's this side length now on the small, being x, to the corresponding large part, which is 15. So again, we set up the proportion. We're pretty much home free if we're confident with our algebra skills. 5 fifteenths is the same as 1 third equals x over 15. And now I'll cross multiply. 1 times 15 is 15. Uh, 3 times x is 3x. And dividing both sides by 3, I get 15 divided by 3, which is 5. Okay, So there you go. Finding a different piece of the puzzle in each of those examples. Now, if you're having a hard time seeing uh, the triangle inside of a triangle, or you have a hard time remembering to combine these two or to combine these two when you're doing your proportions, here's a helpful hint. Just draw them, sorry, redraw them as two separate triangles. We could take this diagram up here and redraw it as the triangle at the top, which we're calling DBE, and we could draw a larger one, and we can call it ABC. And then we can carefully label our new diagram so that we're less likely to make a mistake. This, of course, is 5. This is x. And when you're drawing segment BA, now you'll come up here and say BA is 5 plus 10. Now you're actually staring at the number 15. And uh, this bottom side here is still 15. Now it's real easy once you've established your numbers as a separate activity. Now you can just look at your, your diagrams and trust them a little more. Okay. Now it's time for the part of the program, my favorite part, called the Say What? And this is an application, okay? And there's going to be a lot of information in this application because we're going to deal with an application straight from a physics textbook, okay? Now, I'm sure this has come up some point in your life. You've got a tree. You want to measure how high the tree is. Uh, but for whatever reason, you don't have a tape measure. You don't have a ladder. You don't have the guts to climb a ladder. But you still want to know the height of the tree. Well, did you know that really all you need to accomplish this task is a tape measure or some measuring device a mirror, yep, that's right, a mirror, and of course your very own cerebral cortex. You're going to need your own gray matter to do this. Here's a scenario, okay? We've got a tree over here. Uh, it's in full bloom. It's got nice green foliage. Uh, I'm going to call it H. I don't know what it is. Uh, we're assuming this thing is growing at a right angle to the ground. You're over here, a five foot tall person. So for this example to work, if you are taller than five feet, just uh, imagine that you're slouching a little bit. We've got a five-foot person, and we have a mirror down here. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to position the mirror on the ground, and we are going to set it up so that we can look into the mirror and visualize or see 
the top of the tree reflected in the mirror. Once we've established this position where we can see in the mirror the top of the tree, then we or we can have a helper. It's always fun to do these things with a helper. We're going to take these measurements with our measuring device. In this case, I came up with 102 feet, and we're standing two feet back from the mirror. And of course, you're five feet tall. And even though you're slouching, we're going to assume that you're, you're at the ground uh, to a right angle. Now here's where physics comes in. If we could show that these two triangles were similar, we could set up our proportion. Okay? But we can't just assume that they're similar. We're going to have to prove it. Well, in physics, if we draw a line from the base of this mirror straight up, this is called the surface normal or the normal surface. Okay? And there's a law in physics that says an angle of incidence is congruent to an angle of reflection. Well, this right here would be the angle of incidence. And this over here would be the angle of reflection. They're always to the surface normal. Now, how can we use those angles being congruent to show that these angles are congruent? Well, if this is the surface normal, normal just means perpendicular to the surface. So if, if these two angles are congruent, these are their complements. Remember, they have to add to 90 degrees, so these angles have to be congruent. So now we're looking at the triangle. These angles, by the way, are sometimes called the glancing angles or the glazing angles. So we've got incidence angles, reflection angles, and glancing angles. The glancing angles are congruent. These angles, of course, are congruent because they're both right triangles. Well, if we have two angles in a triangle that are the congruent, then the third ones have to be congruent because, remember, their sums are supplementary. So this angle up here and this angle up here are congruent. So now that we've proven or at least established that all three of the corresponding angles are congruent, we have similar triangles. So we can use all those nice proportions that we had uh, in those previous examples. So here's how we're going to set it up. I always like to get my unknown involved first in the numerator. So I'm going to say H, this side here, the tall side of the big triangle, to this side, 102. So again, I'm switching the way I'm setting the proportion. I'm just saying big triangle, big triangle is to corresponding sides on the smaller triangle. So if I was using the height over here on the big, now it's proportional to the height on the triangle that you or me or whoever is doing this experiment is creating, five feet, is to the base was 102 on the big, so it corresponds to the base two feet on the small. And again, you should feel proud once you set up your proportion very slowly, very carefully, very deliberately, because now it should just be a routine calculus problem. If I cross multiply, there's really nothing to simplify here, I get 2h equals 5 times 102. Now, if you have a calculator or you could do that in your head, that's fine. You're making the number larger there. But I'm going to hold off here. I'm going to divide both sides by 2 right away, and I'm going to get h is equal to 5 times 102 over 2. And I'm going to simplify. 102 divided by 2, that's something that I can handle a lot easier. That's half of 100 to 2, which is going to be 51. And I need to multiply that by 5. So 5 times 51 gives me 255. And the units are going to be in feet. So looky there. Just with a tape measure and a mirror, we can measure the height of this really tall tree here. And we never have to climb a ladder. That's pretty cool. Hey, wasn't that last example great? We were able to measure the height of that tree without ever climbing a ladder. We stayed on the ground nice and safe. Okay, Pretty cool stuff, that math. I hope everyone out there is safe and, at least for now, intellectually satisfied. But unfortunately, it's really time for us to make like our 255-foot tall tree and leaf. So <laughs> until next time, I'm still your Funkadelic Hope, Kevin Corpy, and I'll catch you on the flip side.